Sorry about that. And so I wanted to be able to produce this show for sales and marketing. And it was a show that was designed specifically for you that was not death by PowerPoint, that was absolutely video based. And the format would be a round table just like this, where it was lively, engaging, unscripted, funny, organic, unfiltered. And yes, we are encourage healthy debate. So today we've got some amazing sales experts on the line with us and I'm so excited to be with them today. So when we, when I thought of this show, uh, I said, what do I, what am I going to do? And I'm a, I'm a sports fan. As you already saw, go Niners right here. I don't know if you can see that there's a glare. There we go. Go Niners. And so I wanted to create this, uh, this show to, and, and, and give you all something that would really help you sell more and for marketers for you to be able to, um, help your sales organizations sell more as well. So welcome to our show and thank you for joining us. Now, there's a couple of housekeeping items I want to review with you guys. Uh, the first one is, is absolutely feel free to get out on Twitter and uh, ask, uh, ask any questions, make any statements, uh, repeat any of the things that our panelists are going to say. And one of the things we want to make sure that you do is utilize the hashtag sales Chalk talk, hashtag, for those of you that uh, don't understand hashtag, that's the pound sign. So hashtag sales chalk talk, uh, all one word. And you can certainly tag my uh, handle at M underscore three JR. And that's in the Twitter, I mean, that's in our chat session, as you can see in the window right over here uh, on your screen. In addition, uh, we want to make sure that if you have any questions, <laughs> Dallas Cowboys, I love that in the chat session. If we have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask those questions straight into the chat window. We will get to them at the Q&A um, session at the end, all right? Now, I'm a big believer that we need to be able to make sure that we give our guests, all of you, something of substantial value. And you're going to get some amazing uh, tips from these folks that are on this call. But I want to give you something as well. And what I want to give you is basically two things that you're gonna walk away with to help you use social media better to help you sell. All right, so what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna do a screen share and you're all gonna pull out your phones or your iPads. Feel free to go ahead and grab your phones right now and pull out your iPads or your iPhone. And I'm going to begin a screen share. One of the coolest things that I've ever seen here is the ability to be able to use Zoom and Zoom is our webinar platform which allows us to be able to um, screen share our devices. So let's hope this works, live demo, here we go. Oh, live demo, come on. You're not seeing it, are you? Gotta love live demonstrations. All right, that's okay, here's what we're gonna do. Pull out your phones anyways, I'll walk you through this. There's two things that I wanna show you. And the things that I want to show you right now uh, are as it relates to um, the LinkedIn application. Please find your LinkedIn application right now and go to your LinkedIn application and open that up just like this. Open up your LinkedIn application. And when you get there, I want to show you two things that most salespeople don't even realize um, what they have in their hand. At the very top, you're going to see a big white bar. Okay? That white bar, I want you to go and click on and type in M A R I O. M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z, Mario Martinez. If you need the junior, add on the J-R. You should hopefully see me now at the top of that search. Please click on my profile. Now there are two things that I'm going to show you. Number one, how to send a personalized invite. And this is so important that most salespeople don't even realize that they can send this personalized invitation straight from the mobile device. So we're gonna show you this today. So up in the far right hand corner, you're gonna see right here three little dots. Click on those three little dots, far right hand corner, three little dots. And you should see something that says personalize invite. Go ahead and click on that. And when you click on that, just type in sales chalk talk rules and hit connect. Go ahead and send it to me. Yes, you're not supposed to send blind connection requests, but you're all on part of my show. So you all now know me and you've heard me speak. Go ahead and connect with me right now. But that is how you send a personalized connection request. And that is what your customers are looking for. That's how our organization helping other companies is able to drive a 94% connection rate with, as an average with our other customers by teaching them that trick by using a personalized connection request. All right, lesson number two. 
you uh, now you're back on my profile. And there's something that is so important that you need to understand. I want you to scroll down and I want you to click on my summary section. That's the words where you see right underneath my heading, the summary. When you click on that summary, I want you to scroll down to the bottom. And what you will see are a bunch of multimedia files. Now, about a month ago, LinkedIn changed this setting so you can now see multimedia, videos, PDFs, PowerPoints, whatever it might be, inside of your summary and experience section. Guys, do you realize that 95% of most sales and marketers do not have multimedia embedded inside of their profile? One of the top three marketing strategies that are being used by B2B marketers today is video-based marketing. So here's what I'm here to tell you. Load your profiles up with videos. Why? Because your customers are interested in interacting through video. All right, so those are your two tips of the day uh, here for social media, sales chalk talk, leverage the hashtag sales chalk talk. Now, 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 we get into today's topic. Sales is not about relationships? Question mark. So in today's digitally enabled world, we are all unfortunately connected to this device. Some of us even take it to the bathroom with us. All right, most of us do, Joanne shaking her head. But I'm telling you right now, in a crowd of you asking to raise your hand, who takes this device into the bathroom? Unfortunately, 95% of us will raise our hand. Why do you think our customers are doing anything different? Raise your hand. Thanks, John, for raising your hand. <laughs> so in this digitally enabled world, buyers have changed the game on us. And this creates a challenge for you, today's modern sales rep, and today's leader as well. So the question remains, is the traditional way of selling based upon relationships, is that dead? Has that died? Can you still build a relationship in the social media digitally driven world that we sell in today? Well, today's questions are going to be answered by amazing panelists, and I'm so excited. My friends, these are some amazing giant hitters, and I got to tell you, if you reached out to them and uh, asked them whether or not they could give a keynote, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars here for a one hour cameo. And I have the privilege of getting them on my show. So let's first start out with my friend, Joanne Black, founder of No More Cold Calling. I love her, she's amazing, she's got a couple of books out. Joanne, do us a favor, would you please introduce yourself and tell us the first thing you did when you woke up this morning. Uh, Mario, I think you're getting a little too personal with that question. <laughs> I'm not answering that. <laughs> well, except to say I do brush my teeth. So that's why I have a good smile. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> uh, it's not about me. It's really about my clients. And the reason they hire me is because they have two major challenges. And one of them is getting that consistent stream of qualified leads and getting meetings with decision makers. Those are the two biggies, there's, there's some more, but those are huge. And every sales leader tells me those are their challenges. Well, what, are, what does referral selling do? A referral introduction gets you the meeting with a decision maker. You ask for a referral for the leads you want that are qualified, so you get only qualified leads. That's the power of referral selling. And Joanne, can you give us your uh, Twitter handle so that everybody... Oh, yeah, I, I can. Just a minute, Mario. I have a prop. Uh, I love it. Can you see this? <laughs> <laughs> it's at referral sales. No more cold. Lift it up. Lift it up. No more cold calling. There we go. I love it. No more cold calling. At referral sales. So we'll put that into the chat session. At referral sales. If you could do us that favor. <laughs> Uh, you you definitely are outshining my props here because all I've got is my my me my watch my my notes that, that's all I got my dear. <laughs> well, you know sometimes low tech really works. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it, very good. All right, so let's move on to our. Uh, and by the way, Joanne, um, for your website, if you could do us a favor and throw that into the chat, but tell us where people can go to find out more about you. No more cold calling dot com. No more that's cold calling. Website. Dot com. All Correct. right. And your Twitter handle at referral sales. Correct. I love it. Well, welcome to our show. And I'm super excited to uh, have you with us today. 
Thank you. All right. My next uh, friend and guest and panelist is the great Alice Hyman. And I am super excited because when I learned about Alice's history and where she came from, I was like, are you serious? Do you realize that I spent $7,000 of my own money to go take Miller Hyman training? Now, I know that's not the where you started out with, but that's how I know the great Alice Hyman. And Alice, tell us about yourself. And by the way, please let us know uh, what you did, the first thing that you did this morning when you woke up. Okay, that, that is a little personal. I agree with uh, Joanne, but I will tell you um, that the first thing I did this morning when I got up was I took my retainers out. <laughs> yes, at my ripe old age, Joanne, I had to get braces and I wore my braces for 18 months, Anthony. <laughs> and now I have to wear retainers, so I feel like a 13-year-old. All right. That's the first thing I do when I get up every morning is get those retainers out of my mouth. Okay, good, so thank you. There you have it. I hope some of you can, um, you know, feel my pain. Um, but anyway, um, but I have, I too have a beautiful smile. <laughs> and that, yes, you do. You do have a beautiful smile. <laughs> So thank you to my orthodontist for that. Uh, so yeah, who am I? Wow, well, every day I ask myself that question. Um, that's the second thing I do when I get out of bed. Um, who am I going to be today and how am I gonna make the world a better place? Um, yes, my um, history is with my family business, Miller Hyman. Um, my dad, Steve Hyman, and Bob Miller founded that company back in the 70s when I was still just a young thing. Um, and uh, actually was just in college and, uh, Bob Miller, I've known him since I was three years old. So long history there with uh, Steve and Bob. And um, I really worked for their company on and off for a long time when I was uh, going through college and then um, when I was a public school teacher. But um, I did start working for the company in the early 90s and worked with Miller Hyman for a couple of years and enjoyed that and just learned a ton. I really got catapulted into the world of business because my education was in um, being a teacher and being a special ed teacher and a reading specialist and not in business. So I learned a lot about business uh, from my family business and then worked in it for a while. But I started my own company in 97 and really what I focus on is helping uh, sales leaders grow as a sales leader so that they can get peak performance out of their sales team. And, um, you know, I've been in sales a long time. I've worked, I've, I've sold, I've managed, um, and I've helped many, many companies grow. And I do focus on owner operated companies a lot because people started a business not thinking, Oh gosh, I can't wait to get out and sell. They started a business thinking I want to do this thing that I do well and offer that to my, community and my tribe and not really understanding what they would have to do in order to get business and to sell. And so it's a lot of fun to turn a business into a selling machine. Ah, awesome. And uh, Alice, would you do us a favor, my dear? Uh, and by the way, for everybody who's listening, uh, I, I, I turned to Alice just as, as, as a matter of fact, yesterday and I said, Alice, can you help me out with a business problem that I'm having? And I got to spend, uh, what was it, an hour that we were talking? Maybe it was longer. I don't know. Don't bill me for it, please. <laughs> I probably can't afford it. <laughs> but but I, go to, I turn to folks like Alice to be able to help me from a sales perspective and help me understand how to drive more sales even within my own business. So fabulous to have you on the show. Alice, tell, us, tell everybody, please, where they can find you at. Right. So um, I had to make a prop while Joanne was doing that because I said, oh, I have a prop. Oh, I don't know if you can see it. There we go. There's Alice my Hyman. Twitter. It's at Alice Hyman. Now, all you have to do is spell Hyman right. H-E-I-M-A-N. And you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Snapchat, <laughs> Facebook. And I'm happy. I'm one of those people who's happy to connect with you on all of those because I do put messaging out on all of them and enjoy. Um, as you can tell, I'm a very social person. And so I like social media a lot. So please send me a connection request, but please do send me a little message. So remind me that you, where you met me. And so that I know, um, you know, a little bit about who you are and how, how you know me. And then of course, my website is alicehyman.com. So um, they should use a personalized invitation request like we just showed them in the beginning of the show, yeah? Is that right, Alice? Yes, personalized requests are much appreciated because otherwise I have to take the time to go look you up and figure out who you are. So if you could just use that customize button on your mobile or of course you can do it um, on the computer as well. 
always, this is a tip, always start on the person's profile that you wanna connect with, no matter which device you're using. If you start from their profile and connect, you get the opportunity to write a customized message. So either using those three dots like um, Mario showed you, and then you pick customize, or you can, on your computer, click connect from their profile and it will show you where you can put a personal message in. When you connect from any other place where that blue button tempts you, it doesn't allow you to put a personal message in. And, and FYI, for those of you that I just saw a chat come in that says an email is required when you don't know the person, actually no, here's your hack. Your hack is, is when you go on the desktop, uh, you click the friend, you're a friend. Don't tell LinkedIn I told you that. Um, but it is a hack. Just go through and click friend and you can send the request or do it from the mobile device. All right. Alice, yeah, one I'm more thing on that and um, really quick, uh, Mario, because uh, I do have mindset that you have to have my email address. But if oh. you read my profile first, it's three places in my profile. Okay. So you can get my email address. So I know that you haven't bothered to even read my profile if you can't, you know, can't find my email address. It's all over my profile. So look around in the contact button. Their email address is sometimes there and also on other places in their profile. Perfect. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. And now we're going to move on to uh, also my friend and mentor uh, who's been helping me with uh, giving me some coaching on a book that is soon to come. And I want to introduce to all of you guys, Anthony Andrino, who is actually coming out with his latest book. Uh, and we are producing a post. Look for that in the Huffington Post, guys, by the way. We we're looking for that as a book review on uh, Anthony's book called The Only Sales Guide You'll Ever Need. <laughs> Anthony, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about you and please tell us the first thing that you did this morning as well. I, I don't even know if it's fair for me to have to follow Joanne and Alice. I mean, first <laughs> I think that's unfair. I don't have a retainer. Uh, there's what? nothing I was doing that was so personal that I can't even disclose it like Joanne. <laughs> uh, what, what did I do? The first thing, I do the same thing every day when I get out of bed. And I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and the first thing I do is pour a cup of coffee and then walk into my office and start writing. And I've done that for a long time. And this morning, I had to draft some notes for uh, a friend who is kind enough to review my book in the Huffington Post. So that was number one on the agenda and <laughs> got done first. So, uh, if it didn't get done first, it might not get done. And uh, I did write a book. It's my first book, The Only Sales Guide You'll Ever Need. So we're hustling orders on that right now at preorder.theonlysalesguide.com. And I'm a speaker, a coach, a consultant, an entrepreneur, and a teacher. So I have a whole bunch of roles. Very good. And Anthony, tell us how to find you. Where uh, do people go to A, see your site, find your book, and your Twitter handle? Um, the best place to find me is thesalesblog.com. And the Twitter handle is my last name, Anna Reno, which is why most people, when they first send me an email unsolicited, say, Ian Narino, how are you? And then I know they have no idea who I am. It's okay. Anna Reno, at Anna Reno. And that's spelt as uh, the Twitter handle. You, have you, can you throw that in the chat for everybody as well? You did. I uh, threw it in there. Plus, you can see it uh, under my picture here. All right. Beautiful. Love it. Very good. So that's, that, that's awesome. Thanks. And um, Anthony, uh, just tell us one thing about this particular book. What makes it unique and different? It's the only book that covers who you have to be to be a successful salesperson before it covers the skills you have to gain. So if you haven't gotten your galley, Mario, Mario it's coming to you. The first half of the book are our mindset or attributes or characteristics that you can develop that without um, developing these, you won't succeed nearly as well as you could if you develop them. Things like discipline, optimism, resourcefulness, initiative. And the second half of the book is skills. And I'll just point to the last three. Business acumen, which is a huge differentiator right now. The ability to manage and lead change, that's a big uh, difference maker right now. And leadership, those are skills now for a modern salesperson. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, Anthony. Welcome to the show. And uh, I am stoked because I know that pre-order is going crazy. And yesterday, you couldn't even handle some of the pre-orders with some of the sites. So if you all don't have your hands on this book, you need to get your hands on this book. 
and uh, it's going to be a fabulous addition for your sales uh, skills and, and uh, arsenal to help you sell. So let's get right into our topic. Sales is not about relationships, question mark. Welcome to the panel. Welcome to all of you who've been on the show. I'm so excited. We've got some interesting discussion. We spent a lot of time, my panelists, I was probably driving them crazy over the last couple of weeks because I, I love to have uh, a lively show and I want to make sure that we're prepared to talk about things that are true, near and dear to your guys' heart because we were all, we're all there. All of us still sell today as well. So one of the things that we want to um, take a look at is uh, a statement that Joanne gave me. And in Joanne's uh, statement in the pre-show, she said to me, referral selling is your competitive differentiation. All right, Joanne, tell us what this means. Referral selling is your competitive differentiation. Because we're talking about is sales about relationships. And you're saying referral selling is your competitive differentiation. So tell us what, what's going on here. Oh, it, it is because our goal as salespeople, the way I think about it, is to get in before a client even knows they have a need. What's happening today, so many people are waiting. Marketing sends them leads. You know, you hear this nonsense, and I'm using that word intentionally, that 57%, 67% of the sales process is complete before a buyer ever connects with a salesperson. Well, if you sit back and wait, you're like everybody else. You have no differentiation. Here's what happens. When you receive an introduction, from someone your prospect knows and trusts. They have a solid relationship. They will always take a meeting, and that could be a phone call, it could be an in-person meeting. You get in there, you have that kind of discussion that Anthony's talking about, where you're having a conversation, and you're, you're using discovery questions, you're learning about them you are helping them solidify what the problem is. Because for most of us, when a client says, here's my problem, 80% of the time my guess is that's not really the problem. So as skilled salespeople, we work collaboratively with a prospect to, de to define the problem, craft the solution, and we are in there. The competition, if there is competition, many times there's not, they don't have a clue. We have the inside track because we get information that no one else does. So what I say is, as salespeople, when we get a referral introduction, the deal is ours to lose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Joanne. Uh, that's, it, to some, most salespeople, it feels almost uh, natural that we should leverage referrals. <clears throat> um, but you have a, a very interesting position, and that is uh, that one, it's a one call type of, type of scenario to get the referral. And two, it should never be done over social media. And I, wanna, I want you to talk about that because I want the other panelists as well to, to, to weigh in on this particular topic here. Because I, I have my opinion about it. Oh, I know you have your opinion about it. <laughs> and if you keep asking on social media, you're gonna piss a lot of people off because that's what people have told me. But it, it's beyond that. Uh, you should never, ever, ever ask for a referral in any digital media. So it could be on social media, could you send an email, but never because referral selling is very personal. So Mario, I'm going to refer you because I like you, think you're a pretty cool guy, but I need to know the business reason that you want that introduction. I need to learn where you are now in your business. If I ask for something and I'm just typing away and you and I don't have a conversation, I will not refer you. You need, I need to understand why you want the intro because if I introduce someone, it's very personal. As I said, you, you need to take care of my contact just as I would. And I need to make sure that you understand that. The other thing is so many people accept LinkedIn invitations. They don't even know how the, who the people are. So in one case, I called someone and I said, do you know so-and-so? And he said, no clue who that person is. <laughs> and he said, Joanne, tell me what you're looking for. We had that conversation. He referred me, gave me an introduction to someone else. Now, when you think about it, does that take a little more time? Of course. But how many qualified prospects 
do we really need in a pipeline? And do we just want to keep sending digital, digital, digital when sales is about relationships and you don't form relationships when you sit there and type away? Mm, very good points. Uh, Anthony, thoughts on uh, the commentary. One, referral selling is a competitive differentiation. Two, that you should never uh, give a referral or ask for a referral through uh, online me methods, digital methods. And my light on. What's that? I'm in a uh, I'm in a, a building that is very very sensitive about the waste of electricity. So I'll try to get the light to come back on. So oh, there you go. That's why you're moving around. <laughs> yeah, I'm dancing here trying to get a light to come back on. Very good. All right. Well, well, do you want to start out with you, or want me to move to Alice? No, I'm good. Um, Joanne's exactly right as usual. And um, the the thing about referrals and uh, first off. If we're going to be completely honest, nobody asks for referrals anymore. They're terrible at it. They're afraid of rejection. They're afraid of the conflict. And so the reason that they want to do it by email or by social channels is because they can hide from the reality of asking somebody for something. So they're, they're afraid of the kind of conflict that there could be somebody who wants to know why or might say no or make, they, they don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. So Joanne's exactly right. It is a competitive advantage for you because none of your competitors are doing it. And I mean, literally, they're not doing it. They're not asking. So, and, and that's a travesty because the people who are doing business with you and who appreciate your value want to share you with other people because everybody likes to say, you know what? I got a guy or I got a girl. You need to just talk to my girl. She'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. I got somebody. They like to brag about the relationships that they have where people are creating value for them. Here's, here's I would just tell you, because we want to give value in this, the right thing to do is at the very beginning of a, a commercial relationship to say, uh, listen, Mario, I know you're going to love what we do here for you. And I'm going to ask you that if it's exactly as we promised and if it creates tremendous value for you, at some point after you're completely satisfied, I'm going to come back and ask you to introduce me to a couple people you think might also value from the kind of thing that we're doing here together. Would that be okay with you? I would do it at the beginning. And the reason it's uncomfortable for you is that you waited nine months, you haven't talked to that client, you haven't been checking in on them, and now you gotta call and ask them for a referral. And it's like, where you been? Yeah, I haven't heard from you. You know, uh, I keep sending people the ends of the baker scene from The Godfather since I'm begging people for help with the book, so I keep sending them that. And they, when Enzo comes in to ask the Godfather to take care of the guys that brutalized his daughter, he says, You've never even invited me to dinner at your house. Yeah. I don't even know your family. You know, and now you come in here and had you come to me as a friend, you, this would already be taken care of. It's still always about relationships, Mario. Very good. That's, I, I love, that's a great point about asking at the beginning of the sales cycle and setting that up and teeing that up uh, with the expectation that you can ask for that help. I, I love that. That's a, that's a great point. Um, Mario, Al I have a point of view about that. Okay. So I've seen people do that, Anthony, and if it's comfortable, fine. For many of us, that harkens back to old insurance days, right? When the insurance salesperson would come in, deliver a policy, and have a letter to send to 20 of their best friends, or say that in the beginning. And um, so we need to be able to say it, but, not, but I don't like the question, would it be okay with you? To me, that's what I classify as kind of a begging and pleading comment, that I don't want to ask a question when I'll get a no answer or could get a no answer. So I would, for me, it's easy because people know that I came to them through a referral, so it's not even a question. And by the way, I put it in my uh, statement of work that at the conclusion, exactly what you said, that so-and-so agrees to refer me to, to two of their two of my ideal clients. Now, I never go back and point to that. <laughs> that would be terrible. But, it's, but, but I have an advantage because they know that's my business. But for those of us when it isn't our business, we need to talk about it, but I would, Anthony, phrase it a little differently um, and not sound like an old time insurance person. So more on the lines of, especially if you were referred to them, they know how it works and we are gonna continue to work together and I will stay in touch and we will then collaborate and discuss other people you know that I should meet. Something like that is, is my preferred method, but it's all about style. It's all up to the individual. Do you think I get a lot of no's, Joanne? 
Oh, Anthony, of course you don't. <laughs> No, and um, no, I, we're not talking about you. I just, I just have one little comment on that. Some of the old ways that people are afraid of are now the right ways again. We've gotten too soft. You need to be more direct. It's time to grow up and get into some conflict and go ahead and say the things that we need to say. I think that it, both of you, you know, are right. And what's right about it is that it's salespeople need to have a style. They need to be comfortable. They need to be confident. And when they are comfortable and confident in their style, they will have a way that works for them to have this conversation. And it does need to be more direct. With every one of the sellers that I work with through my clients right now, through the sales managers, I'm coaching the sales managers to coach their people to be more direct. Uh, enough with the meet and greet already. You know, let's learn what they need so we can help them. And so I do think we need to be more direct. But on the, re on the, on the note of the referral selling, I mean, I would say 99% of my business comes re from referral. Yes, people know me on the internet and it certainly does help that I have a, you know, a brand online that lets people get to know me. But typically when I ask them, you know, how they found me, they'll tell me, well, I know so-and-so, but I've been watching you online. And so we have that knowing aspect in many different ways. But when someone directly refers someone to you, it does shorten your sales cycle. You walk in with instant credibility that's yours to keep or lose. Um, and you, you can make selling go faster. And wouldn't it be nice if we, if we could, didn't have to cold call anymore? Not that there's anything wrong with cold contacting is what I call it now. That's great and we do it, but what if all of your business could come from an introduction? And I think introducing people, I do it every single day. Now I use LinkedIn to introduce people because I will send one person's profile to the other and copy them and say, you know, I'm introducing the two of you because I believe there are some synergies that you should know each other or, you know, uh, uh, Joanne asked me to introduce you because, and I'll send each other's profiles to them and let them take it from there so I'm out of the loop. But what Joanne says is true. Either I have to know them well enough and know their company and know enough about them to make a good referral or I have to ask them. So having that personal conversation about why you want to be introduced to someone helps me make a better introduction. And so that's really what it's all about. How can I make the best introduction for you so that it carries you where you want to go versus I could just slap something together with not enough information and the person's not going to respond to that because there's no reason for them to. It's just as bad as a cold call. So it's personal in that way that either you have to know, like with my clients, I can refer them like that. I know their business. I know what they do. I know how they do it. I know they'll take care. They wouldn't be my clients otherwise. So I can refer them without having that conversation that Joanne was talking about. I already know. But when someone comes to me that I don't really know, and like it just happened to me yesterday, somebody asked me to introduce them to someone. I said, I can introduce you, but I cannot endorse you. So this is what I can do. I can say, you two are in this type of business. I know that the two of you should have a conversation. That's the introduction I can make. I've never used <laughs> services. I don't know anyone who's used your services. So a referral isn't really what I can do. I can make an introduction, but not an endorsement. So I think it's just people need to be clear when they're asking you. And I think what Joanne's talking about is these random pleas on LinkedIn. Can you introduce me to so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so? I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. Why would I do that? You know, that, that doesn't make a good, that doesn't, and it, it could tarnish my reputation as well. And then, then I'm no good to anybody. Once my reputation is tarnished, then my introductions mean nothing after that. <laughs> that I, I, I can, well, all of you guys have made valuable, really valuable points. Alice, love it. I can introduce you, but I can't endorse you. Right. Or maybe another way that I might say it is I can introduce you, but um, that's about the extent because I really haven't used your services before. Right. So we're, we're salespeople and we can make those introductions when we don't have a strong relationship. And I encourage folks um, for my philosophy. We talk a lot about in our training, our social selling training is to actually leverage social media to be able to help that. So I know Joanne and I differ a little bit on that. But th the fact of the matter is, is, is that I think it's about style and it's about you have to know the relationship. To, to understand whether you should pick up the phone or whether you should make an introduction. And just yesterday, um, Anthony introduced me to somebody that he's working with on, on a particular aspect of his business. And it was boom, boom. And already this morning, we're, we're working on proposals. So uh, it, it works. The electronic method works based upon the relationship. So great points. Alice, I want to turn to you. 
you said something in the pre-show that actually took me took me back a little bit and I was like, hmm, this is an interesting thought here. And I know Joanne and Anthony are going to jump all over this one. You said, you do not need to build a relationship in order to sell something. Right. Expand, please. Good, it's bad. Right. Is that the norm? Should reps do that? People do it all the time. It's been done in the past and it will continue to be done. In a consumer sale, uh, in a retail sale, in a business to consumer sale, people buy things when they need them and it doesn't always depend on the salesperson having a relationship with them. And unfortunately, in a B2B sale, in a business to business sale, people are selling without building relationships. It happens all the time. Is it a good thing? Well, when you have numbers to hit and tremendous pressure on you as a sales rep and tremendous pressure on the sales manager to get their sales reps to perform, people, the salespeople don't stop to think about whether they're making a customer for a lifetime or just a transaction. They just need to hit their numbers. And it's a whole nother thing I could rail on for days about the pressure we put on salespeople and the way we pressured them. But the fact of the matter is, yes, you can sell stuff without having a relationship. Unfortunately, in a business to business sale, it happens all the time. What we want to do is start to think about how would that be different if we did have a relationship and how with the pressure that's put on salespeople today, the, the, um, uh, the SDRs, as they call them, the, you know, the development reps who are out there dialing for dollars, get an appointment, just get that first call. How could they spend a small amount of time and start to develop a little bit of a relationship and know something about the person so that we could move the sale more quickly. We could show people that we care about them and not just about making a sale. We could do a lot of things, but the fact of the matter is people sell all the time without having a relationship. Anthony, get your thoughts on that. Is that the right approach <clears throat> from a sales perspective? Should you focus on building a relationship? Can you sell something without it? Turn and burn, what should you do? You, uh, I mean, Alice is right, mostly. <laughs> mostly? I mean, the, mostly, <laughs> yeah. There are people who do, and there are people who try to transact. I mean, that's still true, but I will tell you that in 2016, and from this point forward, that's not a very good decision to make as a salesperson. And I don't care if it's retail or otherwise. I have a, the retail Apple store. They know me. So, I mean, they'll tell you when I walk in, they'll be like, this is the guy that bought the first MacBook Air ever sold at this store, you know, and uh, I buy a lot of Apple products. Yesterday, as soon as the announcement on the iPhone 7 came out, uh, they called me and said, do you want one? And I said, yeah. And they said, which one? I said, I'm going to get the 7 Plus. And they said, what color would you like? And I told them what color I would like. And they said, uh, we'll hold it for you. They, they're not allowed to hold things. They're not, you got to put your name on the list. You got to sign up online. They're holding it for me. And uh, true story, when the six came out, my uh, youngest daughter said, you know, you think you're special because you get to jump the line, but you're not. I want you to know that you're not special. <laughs> and uh, I was getting the six for the whole family. And then about, I couldn't make it to the store to pick them up. And about two days later, she's like, where are our phones? Why haven't you done that yet? <laughs> and it's because I have a relationship with people that even at the retail level, they reached out and developed a relationship with me. And they said, this is somebody who comes into our store all the time. We know him. He buys stuff from us. He comes in. He's nice to us. We're helpful to him. And they know they're going to do something for me, and I'm going to do something for them. That's how it works. That's relationships. Even at that level, it matters. But when you get into B2B and you get into a complex sale where there's multiple stakeholders, where it's high risk, it's strategic value, there's lots of decisions um, that need to be made and where there's a lot at risk, you absolutely need the relationship. And the reason that some people end up transacting is because they didn't build the relationship when they needed it. And so now they're behind and they're struggling to make their number because they didn't build relationships when they had the chance to build the relationship. And the time to build relationships is before you need those relationships. That's how it works. That's the equity that you have in the relationship is the time you've invested and the emotional energy you invested before you need something. So if you've waited, you already misunderstand how the game of sales is played. It's a game of relationships. And Mari, you know my notes on this is uh, all things being equal relationships win. 
all things being unequal, relationships still win. Right. That's right. And your job is to make all things unequal. And I think that the salespeople out there doing, trying to sell without relationships in a business to business sale are doing it because they're being directed to do it. And if you're bold enough as a salesperson to stand up and say, this is not the best way to do this. It's not good for the health of our company or our customers. We need to have the time and the resources to learn about our, the people we're calling and build a bit of a relationship, find some things we have in common before we pick up the phone. Um, but not everybody's bold enough to stand up and say that. So sales managers, I task you with that. Don't let that happen. We, as Anthony said, 2016 and, and forward, we have to build relationships. We, it's part of making a better world in general. It's better for everybody, the health of all companies. So stand up for yourselves, salespeople. Sales managers, stand up for your salespeople. They need the time and the resources to build relationships. That's a good point. Joanne, give you an opportunity to uh, comment and then we'll move on to, uh, to one of Anthony's points here. Your thoughts. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, sales is about relationships, period. But the point I want to make is there's so much focus today on making the relationships, building the relationships, not just with individuals, but with teams. Sales leaders um, position this all the time. And so then they make the sale. And then what happens? What happens with the relationship? We're not paying attention to that. So, so many times what happens, especially in software sales, is the salesperson uh, makes the deal, okay? The team has been responsible all through the sales process. And then it's handed off to a customer relationship manager, sales success, whatever you want to call that person. And then the salesperson goes off to the next one. Well, the salesperson is the one that has the depth of the relationships right. Right. and they're not leveraging those, number one, to build referrals and two, that they lose touch with the client. And when they lose touch with the client, there's a high risk they'll lose that client. Yeah. Well, that's my problem with the hunter model, because if you just send people out, get new business, get new business, get new business, who is taking care of the, I agree with everything Joanne said, you know, here now I've left you and you're stuck with this person, like it or not, the transitions are less than, you know, adequate and it doesn't give us a chance to get the referrals in the way that we need to. So we send people out to hunt and, and cold contact when there is plenty of business from the people your current customers could refer to you. But like with the client I have now, currently, their business development reps are not allowed to go back to that customer once they're handed off. And so they are forced to just go out and cold contact instead of leveraging. Now, if they were allowed to continue the conversations and go wide and deep while their, their customer success team is doing their thing, why can't you have two people in a, your company talking to your customer? It's ridiculous. And you're, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face because now you've lost the opportunity to get those great referrals. Yeah, I think uh, I think that we could even almost have, almost have a whole other show about hunter farmer <laughs> models between in sales organizations and uh, the SDR model, the inside sales model, and pounding away on the phones. We we could have a whole show about that. But that that's great dialogue, guys. I want to move on to a um, point that Anthony talked about in the pregame show, and that was he made a statement that was very um, bold to me, and. I'm all about uh, providing a competitive differentiator uh, through the sales process, Anthony. And you said your job is to make all things unequal. Now you, you mentioned, you said that a little bit earlier in the show here, your job is to make things, all things um, unequal. What does that mean? And how does a sales rep today apply that in the sales process? Yeah, it's, it's probably one of the most underappreciated idea in sales today. And we have all these calls, we have all these interactions with people, and what are we doing? We're doing a discovery visit, right? And then we know the outcome of the discovery visit is maybe we want to bring somebody else into the, the conversation. We want to bring in another stakeholder and start building consensus. So we have all these goals and we have all these meetings, and we think about the meeting and we think about the outcome that we're trying to get. But that's only part of the outcome. It's only part of what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a preference for ourselves and for our solution and for our company. We're trying to create a preference, which means 
I have to start tilting the playing field in my direction. And how do you do that? I mean, we can say a lot of things have changed in sales and a lot of things have changed, but some things that haven't changed uh, for at least 50,000 years, <laughs> we still want to do business with people that we know, that we like, and that we trust. That isn't going to change. Those might mean different things now because there's now an economic component to the know, like, and trust that maybe didn't exist in an easier and a simpler time than the time we live in. But your job is to create competitive advantage. So that means you have to go in and you have to have greater insight than anybody else. You have to have a point of view that's different from anybody else. You have to have a strong depth of business acumen and situational knowledge that says, I can help you think through your problem and I can help show you the trade-offs and the concessions that you're gonna to have to make between different choices. I can show you the right answer and how to get there. I can create both relationship value, which means you know me, you like me, and you trust me, and I'm gonna create economic value. But you have to start thinking, how do I create that wedge? How do I create the compelling differentiated advantage that makes it easy for somebody to buy from me? And, and you, you have people like this in your life now, all of us do. We all have people who, when it, it would come down to a competitive situation, would say, listen, I use Joanne. Joanne's the person that I use. It's not up for debate. I'm not talking about it. It's Joanne. I have a relationship. She knows me. We're intimate. She understands my business. I would have to spend years bringing somebody up to speed to, to do what she does. And that's the power of relationships. Alice is smirking too. And <laughs> she, she gives her feelings away just so easily. Um, you're, it, it is the, the game of sales is it's a, a zero sum game. So we have to play it like it's a zero sum game. You're trying to create competitive advantage. Very good point. Joanne, uh, thoughts on that. Your job is to make all things unequal and give some, a reply back to what Anthony said there. Oh, I agree 100%. I mean, you can't sound like everybody else. And so many times today, I've seen it, I've heard it, salespeople pitch. And it just, I want to climb a tree when everybody says, oh, what's your pitch deck? Or what, you know, we're not pitching. We're having conversations. We're uncovering needs. We're, we're building that um, collaborative model with prospects. That's how it works. I mean, I, I scored a beating with the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And that was through a referral introduction from one of his best clients. And in that 30 minute conversation, we really didn't talk about what I did. He shared with me about his, his son going into sales, what was going on and what he wanted from salespeople, which were insights. That's what everybody wants. However, today, and going back to your point, Alice, the way so many sales teams are organized, people aren't equipped to have those kind of insightful conversations. Oh yeah. Can I, can I add one point? Yeah. The great thing about having a relationship is that you can call or walk into your client's office and say, I want to pitch you an idea. And they say, pitch me. They're not turned off by it at all. Without the relationship and you walk in and you pitch, like Joanne no, said, right. you, you're no. they're like, we, we, we're not there yet. You and I don't know each other well enough for you to do that. The value of the relationship, it shortens the cycle for every deal after that. The greater value you create, the relationship's deeper. I'm sending notes to clients right now saying, I want to pitch you my book, and I got a deadline, and I need your money. And, and the, relation, the only reason that works is because I have a relationship that with, can withstand that. Right, right. Otherwise, they're like, hello. Yeah, no, it's true. And, but I think, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what is a business relationship. And Mario, you and I talked about this, and I think it's really important because I think some salespeople really don't know what does it mean? What kind of relationship do I have with them? How much of a relationship? What, you know, what does that look like? How do you get a relationship? These, you know, you're a salesperson. This is a CEO. This CEO doesn't want to have a relationship with me, salesperson, you know? So I think that we have to talk about what is a business relationship. Are you buddy, buddy with everybody you sell to? Not necessarily. Do you become personal friends after a while? Well, people always blame me or maybe think it's funny or something because I love my clients so much. I do become friends with all of my clients. The CEOs that I work with and the sales leaders that I work with, I, am, I end up being personal friends with them. Why? Because I spend a lot of time with them and some of that time we, oh, how are your kids or what's bugging you today? Well, it's nothing with work, my mother's ill. You do get to know people. If you genuinely care about people and what you sell and what you do, you can't help 
but build a relationship and become friends with some of the people. But if you're an SDR and you're dialing for dollars, do you have the opportunity to become friends with anybody? No, not necessarily, but you can build a relationship. And part of it starts with being there before they even know they need you. So if you know who your ideal customer is and you know who you're going to be calling, you've got a list. If you can you help yourself by using social media to be in touch with those people ahead of time and not sending them spammy sales messages, but interacting with them, click like, comment, share, you know, possibly send them an article that they might be interested in, you know, ask them to connect, but then don't try to sell anything, get to know them, learn. You have an opportunity to start building a business relationship that's built on the fact that you're an expert in what you do and you can add value and you allow them to see that and know who you are. This is why it's so important to have your profile filled out on LinkedIn. I can't like somebody I can't know. No picture, how do I know you? How do I bond with you? No um, information about where you volunteer or what organizations you belong to. I don't have the opportunity to go, oh, you volunteer for the Boys and Girls Club, so do I. I don't have the opportunity to say, um, oh, you're a member of the American Marketing Association, so am I. Or, oh, you went to Indiana University, so did I, right? Those are the things that help us build a business relationship, finding things we have in common. And if your manager or your company doesn't allow you to research the people that you're gonna cold contact and find something you have in common, you, you don't get the opportunity to build a relationship before you call them. And then when you have 16 seconds to say, hey, listen, uh, you weren't expecting my call, but um, I have something you might be interested in. I just need to know, yes or no, are you? And then book an appointment. How do you build a relationship when you're doing that? Yes. So I think a business relationship is having some things in common, knowing things about your own company and your own industry, but more importantly about their company and their industry and them that allows you to start to have something in common and something to talk about. So you can start building a business relationship and it doesn't have to be buddies. It's about business and showing them you care and you know who they are. Yeah, that's actually a question that came in is what does a business relationship look like? And you know, I have a philosophy um, coming from uh, having run sales organizations, one of the things that I feel, and I'll, I'll get your response on this one, answer the question, what does a business relationship look like for Anthony and Joanne, but get your response to this as well. The worst days that a sales leadership team, in my opinion, can have a sales meeting or tell a sales rep to do admin work is on Fridays and Mondays. Here's why. Fridays, you get to have, if you pack up your calendar to have meetings with prospects or buyers, you get to open up every conversation with any special plans this weekend. And what do you learn? What do you find out? You find out great information about them and what they're doing, their family, their likes, their dislikes. Mondays, did you do anything special for the weekend? And you get to find out phenomenal information. And so my personal perspective is those are some of the worst things that people can do. And you really need to pull that data out of your buyers to be able to build that relationship so that on a personal level, at least somewhat of a personal level. So um, let's go with Joanne. Joanne, thoughts on what does a business relationship look like and maybe any, any feedback on the commentary? Yes, feedback. Um, just building on what Anthony said, um, it's, and I love when you said, I want to pitch you because when you have a relationship, you can use that phrase. But I also think that a, a strong relationship uh, stands up to pushback. So I've had clients who said, well, I think we should do this. And I know that's not the way they should go. I need to be able to have that conversation with them about, from my experience, I know what works and doesn't, and they want to succeed, and then brainstorm other possibilities. I want to continue to, to shape that. And that's the strength of a business relationship. When a client values your insights and your recommendations and your expertise, your experience of what's happened with other clients, the other a thing that I look at is kind of a litmus test and is the ability to walk away. So if something isn't right, so say you've been working with a client for a while, you have a phenomenal relationship and they come up with something else they want done and that's not really the work you do. You need to be willing to walk away, but not before you refer them to a good source. That is the test of a solid business relationship. 
Yeah, good. Anthony, go ahead in uh, 60 seconds or less, because I want to move on to another question here. Any feedback or thoughts on that particular um, statement about what does a business relationship look like? I, I just think this is pretty simple. If you think about a uh, continuum, uh, horizontal and vertical, and you think about four boxes, you need relationship value and you need economic value. And what you're searching for is the way to develop the best known, liked, trusted personal relationship along with the highest economic value. So you're moving up towards that top right quadrant. And I call that level four where it's maximum known, liked, and trust and maximum economic value. So it's proactive, it's accountable, it's based on value, but it's still deep caring, deep proactivity, and, and always leading with value. Very good. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, there's a question that we have here, and I want to be able to get this before the end of our program here. We've got about uh, two minutes. And the question says, in a high volume, high transaction B2B sales environment, we touched on this a little bit, can you talk about the benefits of building a relationship? Let's go with Joanne. Uh, I can't answer that question. I'm not the right person because those aren't my clients. My clients are sales leaders who have a field sales team who have complex business relationships and need to build them that way. So I'm not the right person to answer that question, Mario. Uh, Anthony? Yeah, here's the thing, and this is all human relationships. In all human relationships, fast is slow and slow is fast. So here's the thing, the more that you need something, I mean, it's almost like uh, the Zen Buddhist saying, if you don't have time to meditate for an hour, meditate for two hours. Um, if you don't have time to build relationships, then it's double the time you use spending building relationships. That's it. The, the high volume has nothing to do with it. You have to be personal. I'll just give you one hint. If I'm in that environment, the first thing I want to teach people to do is disclose something personal about yourself at the very beginning so you can show your vulnerability and you can make it okay for other people to start sharing. Everybody on this call except me wants to let their hair down. Um, I mean, you, you want to do business with people where it's okay for you to be you. And when we're stiff and rigid and we think we're being professional, we're preventing the connection, the intimacy that allows the relationship to develop. So you have to get there faster. But if you want to go fast, you got to go slow. Slow is where the speed comes from. The deeper the relationship, the faster things go. So it's, it's a waste of time to say, I'm just going to hammer for more and make it go faster. The right thing to do is to say, how do I make sure that this person has everything they need to say yes to the next commitment I need? Very good. Alice got, knows everything though, so ask her. <laughs> no, you know, um, well, Alice, Alice, we've got 20 seconds. High volume is a tough one. And I think we should rethink our sales strategy at a higher level if we are demanding really high volume from people and not caring about the long term. So, I think, you know, I, I agree with, with Anthony and uh, I agree with Joanne saying, you know, Ugh, so don't do high volume. I don't know what to say. I mean, it's just not the best sales strategy. And in the end, I don't believe it's sustainable. And I think the company will go better and faster if they reconsider their approach. We will make that as a topic of discussion for high volume transactional sales teams. I think that's a great topic. Guys. You have been phenomenal. I want to thank everybody for joining us today with Sales Chalk Talk. Visit m3jr.com, m3jr.com. Go to resources and events, uh, and you'll have a chance to be able to see what we're coming up with. And on September 21st, we will be talking about social selling versus cold calling. Which one will win? So join us for that particular event. Thanks so much for joining Sales Chalk Talk. Bleah. Sales Talk Chalk. I'm excited to have you with us. I'm Mario Martinez. Please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn and connect with me. Take care and have a great day.